Hello, my name is Bob Roop, and my function here today is to introduce a documentation that I'm calling and the people associated with me are calling Plan B. And there's a lot of people out there that might recognize me, and those people would be called wrestling fans. The greatest majority of you won't recognize me because you're not wrestling fans. In truth, my occupation is that of a professional wrestler. My purpose here today is to tell you about professional wrestling, not what you're used to seeing, not the burlesque sort of carnival sideshow type wrestling show that you're used to seeing, but what wrestling, professional wrestling, in actuality really is. I think in order that I should start by giving you some of my personal background so you have an idea of my information and the, the, where I'm coming from and the things that I tell you. In 1968, I was on the United States Olympic team that went to Mexico City. I was a Greco-Roman heavyweight wrestler. After competing in the, in the Olympics, I returned to the college I'd been going to, Southern Illinois, and graduated a year later with a liberal arts degree. I had been offered a variety of jobs, uh, teaching, coaching, working for the government, but none of them matched uh, the money first and in a way the mystique that professional wrestling had to offer. Now I'd always heard that professional wrestling was fake. We've all heard that. But I didn't know. And it is a very close society. I found that out right away. Well, I've been in wrestling 10 years now. In those 10 years, I've gone from one being awed by that mystique and being taken in by it. I've gone from one being, in a sense, grateful to be a member of a secret club, a closed fraternity, you might say, and that's what professional wrestling is. I've been a preliminary wrestler, I've been a main event wrestler, I've been a booker. And a quick definition, a booker is a man that works in a particular wrestling area that arranges all the matches, he, he directs the television show to create that certain effect that will try to draw people into the, the wrestling arenas to see those matches. He secures different wrestling talents, uh, exchanges talents. He handles the day-to-day -day operation of the actual promotion. He's the director. He's called a booker in wrestling uh, vernacular. I've been a booker and, and, again, a director. And then I've moved up to the final step in wrestling promotion, that of a promoter. I've been a promoter. I've actually promoted wrestling matches. I've promoted myself in wrestling matches and naturally I couldn't let anybody know that I was promoting myself because there would seem to be collusion. So let's go back over that again briefly. The Olympics. College degree. The entire spectrum of experience in the wrestling business. And I've been in it 10 years now. Professional wrestling. And it is just that business. And I just want to say one thing. In all the time that I've been in professional wrestling, I have never, ever had a real wrestling match. Every match that I've been in, or so-called match, has been merely an exhibition that was designed to attract fans to come in to see the matches, to get their money. And they, the only problem with that is that the matches have been billed as they've been tried to create the effect that these matches were, in effect, going to be real matches, that the people were mad at each other. That has never been the case. I've wrestled in Europe, the Far East, all over the world, Australia, Japan, and all over the United States, and I've never had a real match. You have no reason, most of you out there that are seeing this documentary, have no reason to 
take my word for it. You don't know me, and unless you're a wrestling fan, you've never seen me before. For that reason, I would like to offer some corroboration. And I'd like to introduce a friend of mine, a gentleman named Larry Simon. His experience, 25 years of wrestling. Larry, I'll let you tell your own story. Thank you, Bob. I, uh, I'm used to being in front of the TV cameras, but in a different light. I'm used to being a performer. As Bob said, my name is Larry Simon. I'm from Newark, New Jersey, and I've been wrestling professionally, uh, may I correct, about 27 years. I have had, I'd say, uh, four or five years of amateur experience. I have, from the amateurs, became a professional at a young age of 18 years old. And I am now 47 years old, and I've been wrestling all this time. I was in the professional ranks at 18, as I just got done saying, and when I was 18, I was in the preliminary matches, and I stayed in the preliminary matches for approximately, I'd say, seven years. I wrestled in and around the New York area. And when I went out from the New York area, I went to Houston, Texas. I then took on a so-called gimmick or an image as a Russian. And my name was changed to the great Malenko. And I have been wrestling for the last 20 years as the great Malenko. I have been what they call on top of the ladder. On top is a vernacular we use in our business for 20 years. I have wrestled all over the country. I have been on top in Florida, the Carolinas, the Tennessee area, Nebraska, Texas. And my trademark through the years, people that have been watching wrestling, people that have followed wrestling, have known me as a person that stands in that camera each week with his eye cocked like this. And this is my shtick. This is my gimmick. I would say something in reference to this. My voice would change. I would accumulate an accent as I'm talking to you here and now. I am 230 pounds of mind and muscular coordination that is unbeatable. This is something that I am an expert at. But as well as the light side, I would like to show you something else or tell you something. I have never had in all the 27 years of being a professional wrestling what you call a real wrestling match. You can call it whatever you want. It was a planned type of match. I knew who was going to win and I knew who was going to lose. It was all set up before I ever went out to wrestle. But one thing at one time did occur. In the match, even though I did not never get hurt seriously in a professional wrestling match, coming out of the ring in Richmond, Virginia, and I have wrestled all over the world, I had a fan cut me on the side, getting angry at me and my tactics, and taking a slice of my side, which caused me to have 70 stitches. Now, <clears throat> I would like to one more time reiterate and say that I have never in all my 27 years ever, ever had a real wrestling match. And to corroborate my story, I would like to introduce you to a dear friend of mine, a gentleman by the name of Ron Wright, who has a great deal of experience along with me. Here he is now. Thank you, Larry. My name is uh, Ronald Wright. I have uh, wrestled for the past 25 years as a professional wrestler, mostly in the Tennessee area and on the eastern coast of the United States. In my 25 year, I, like Mr. Malenko, have never had a real legitimate wrestling match. My wrestling matches have all been pre-planned and worked out before ever entering the ring in any of the cities that I have ever wrestled or more like that I've ever performed in. Uh, myself, like Mr. Malenko, 
the uh, only real fights that I have ever had in professional wrestling in 25 years has come from the spectators. Uh, at times I've been in the ring performing for the spectators and maybe I performed a little too well and I would get the spectators a little too riled up. One night in Greenville, Tennessee, I had one of these such occasions that I got the fans uh, too mad with my make-believe wrestling and I had 191 stitches put in my back. I'll turn around here where you can get a close-up view of the scar down my back. You can get a close-up view there. You can see that I have been cut from the shoulder all the way down below the belt buckle, 38 stitches in the back of my head, 18 more stitches in the left shoulder from the stab wound, all in the same night. There have been other times in different cities that I have been stabbed two or three more times on different occasions. But, like I said before, in the entire years that I have wrestled, 25 years, I have never had a real, legitimate wrestling match. They were always pre-planned, pre-arranged by the wrestling booker that we call him, or the promoters in every city that I have ever wrestled. And to back my story up, I would like to bring another man out here that's been well known all over the United States and bring him on the set and introduce him. This is Ronnie Garvin. Well, thank you, Ron. Uh, Ron and I have many fights. None of them real, of course, because <laughs> he's a great friend of mine. So is Professor Malenko, so is Bob Roop. Especially Professor Malenko and I, we go quite a few years. I've been in wrestling 18 years. I've known him uh, at least 10 or 12 years. Uh, Professor Malenko and I, we had some great matches that people believe. Even at times I was uh, almost believing him. That's how great of an actor I consider myself. So it's professor. I respect his talent as an actor, as a performer. Uh, I'm from Montreal and I've, uh, I was brought up in the streets fighting with baseball bats, chains, and uh, wrestling, professional wrestling to me was uh, really something that uh, I looked up to when I was a kid. And I wanted to become a professional wrestler. And I did. And uh, I was kind of disappointed. In a way, in a way not, because money was good. I made good money. I've been a top wrestler for the past 10 years. And uh, especially in part of Tennessee, around Knoxville area, I'm known as a one-man gang. People really believe in me. Well, I can fight, but in all my wrestling career, I have yet to have a real wrestling match. All my matches have been arranged. I went out in the ring and used chairs and gimmicks that wrestlers call, and I'm good at it because I convince the people. People think I'm a maniac. Actually, I'm not. <laughs> I'm a great actor just like a movie actor that can make you cry. Well, I can make you come out of your seat and jumping up, jumping up and down, create excitement. It's my job, that's why I get paid for. And actually, I'm a calm person. And when I make interviews, I go crazy. My eyes, my facial expression change. This is what I do. And people do believe me. And like I said, I have yet to have a real wrestling match. And I've got many friends. Well, as a matter of fact, I've got five good friends in wrestling that we had great battles, grudges, cage matches, chain matches, that I would bet my life that I could make anybody believe it. But actually, after it's over, we're probably drinking a beer, smoking, eating, you name it, we do it. Loving together, parties, that's the way of life in wrestling. Now I've got a good friend of mine, I've got, I've got great respect for him, he's a great performer. I love to work with him. The word work means wrestle, because actually we work together. I want to introduce you to him, his name is Bob Orton Jr. Hey Ronnie, I appreciate the introduction. 
They didn't save the best for last, believe me. They saved the youngest for last. Because these are honest people and the youngest should go last. But ladies and gentlemen, I would like to tell you this. I started going to the wrestling matches at the age of five years old. And I believed everything I seen. I mean, when people got thrown out of the ring and got split open and the blood flew, hey, I believed it. And yes, I become excited. But then one night I seen a man in the middle of a wrestling ring and another man named Fred Blassie looked like he was ripping his eyes out of his head. And I broke down into tears and I actually went into hysterics. I was hard to control. You know who that man was? My father, Bob Orton Sr. And that night home in the car, when I was eight years old, I'm still crying. I'm wondering how Dad can see while he's driving down the road. Well, Dad told me, Bob, there's nothing to worry about. Everything that goes on in a wrestling ring is a fabrication. It's something that you do to make wrestling fans believe that what you're doing is real, but in actuality, it's not. And yes, from that point, I grew into a teenager, and I become very interested in wrestling. And I become an amateur wrestler. And no, I was not a Bob Roop. I didn't go to the Olympics. I was not a national champion. But I was a three-time state champion in three different states, and I was an All-American. And then, lo and behold, I broke into the pros. And I'll tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. Since the time I started professional wrestling, I'm 29 now. I started pro wrestling when I was 21. I have never had a real wrestling match. And you can look at it as good or bad, whatever, but what I'm saying right now is that when you see professional wrestling, the winner and the loser is determined. The worst any wrestler that I know has ever been hurt in the ring Broken arm, broken leg is an accident. And, of course, we've already seen Professor Malenko, Ron Wright, out here showing the scars where an occasional hot-tempered audience may use a knife, slice a man, throw a rock at a man's head, or whatever. But what I'm going to do right now is I've told my story. I've told you the truth. We're honest people. I'm going to give this back to Bob Roop because he is the man. Ladies and gentlemen, those of you watching this, what you're seeing is historic in a sense because of the fact that nobody's ever had the courage and in a sense the dignity to come out here and say the things they've been saying. We've all been conditioned to protect the wrestling industry because it is big business. It's a billion dollar business. They only report about 330 million of it a year. Third largest spectator sport. But it is big business, and we've been conditioned to protect it, even though it is a fraud. Well, this is just the outline. This is the first part of a mini-series that we have planned. And in later segments, we're going to talk about well, the second question I was ever asked after is wrestling fake was, where does the blood come from? We're going to do a whole segment on where does the blood come from. We're going to show you exactly where it comes from. We're going to demonstrate terms of the wrestling business, how the actual manipulations work. That's going to be another segment. We're going to do a segment about the money. Like I just said, a billion dollars a year earned and only $330 million reported. Huh, the IRS is surprised about that, I imagine. We're going to talk about legal prostitution, great big muscular wrestlers being in effect just prostitutes. Prostitutes with muscles, we'll call that segment. We're going to talk about the mon monopoly of the wrestling business. It's a monopoly, and we're going to talk about the political connections that enable it to stay a monopoly. We're going to talk about the impact of homosexuality on the wrestling business. We're going to talk about drug abuse in the wrestling business, and it's prevalent, believe me. We're going to talk about the federal laws that are being broken knowingly with the cooperation of federal authorities. We're going to talk about the destructive nature of pro wrestling upon the human being over a long-term basis. We're going to talk about the fear and loathing 
of the promoters against any attempts to unionize, wrestlers have no protection. Management is organized and labor isn't. The wrestlers themselves have no benefits at all. No pension plan, no health insurance, no life insurance, no retirement plan, no protection for their families, nothing. And the promoters do. <laughs> That's not only illegal, it's immoral. And the last but not least, we're going to get into the personal effect, talking about wrestlers, the particular gimmicks. For you wrestling fans, this is going to be real interesting because we're going to talk about some of your favorites and your not so favorites. And we're going to tell you what they're doing and how they're doing it. And they're not going to be favorites or unfavorites any longer.